Hello, wise ones. We have officially launched All the Wiser membership. If you love this show and the stories and wisdom we share, this is for you. We have everything from early release, live Zooms with me and the All the Wiser team, and you can even drop in and watch a recording. You can also get voice memos directly from me and receive producer credit with your name added to our website wall. You can learn more about the membership, including a short video for me, and sign up for the membership using the Patreon link below in our show notes. You can also go to allthewiserpodcast.com or Instagram at allthewiserpodcast to learn more. I don't think 14-year-old Rebecca could ever conceive of the life that I have now. 14-year-old Rebecca was in survival mode and didn't dare to dream this big. When was the last time you allowed yourself to dream? Even asking that question makes me think of the famous song, To Dream the Impossible Dream. The song talks about following dreams that seem like they would never be achievable. To do what's right and be willing to go through hell itself in order to reach your ultimate goal, referred to as the unreachable star. I'm Kimmy Culp, and this is All the Wiser a show about hope and possibility on the other side of pain. This week, we are talking about dreams and potential with a woman who everyone wrote off, but who ultimately reached that unreachable star. Rebecca Berger knew from a very young age that she wanted to be a doctor. At the age of seven or eight, she became fascinated with blood and why we bleed. In fifth grade, we were shown the puberty movie in school. I was fascinated. I think I was just like more fascinated by any by the movie more than anyone in the room. And so those were my dreams. And then it just kind of died out when all the chaos at home was going on. And then I got pregnant. As a young girl, she endured unthinkable pain and sorrow starting at just four years old. She is a survivor of sexual, emotional, and physical abuse. And today, she is a family medicine doctor, a mother of three, living and working in Southern California. Hello, Rebecca, and welcome to All the Wiser. Hi, Kimmy. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. So, you know, I want to talk about where your story begins and the backdrop of your childhood. So can you, you know, set the stage for your early years? Yes. So I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. My childhood was definitely had some challenges. My mother had some mental health struggles. I did not really have my father present in my life. And I had a stepfather from the time I can remember, age three or four, all the way till my preteen years. My stepfather abused me, specifically sexually abused me for most of my childhood. Not only was there abuse while I was growing up, he was also addicted to crack cocaine, and that also came with its own set of challenges. And what were you like as a young girl? As a young girl, I was always very much a people pleaser. I think it was just kind of instilled in me from an early age. I was always very academically gifted and very interested in math and science. That was always, from the time I can remember, something that I was super interested in and carried over into, you know, my older years. And what was the reality of living 
with a mother who was mentally ill and, you know, a father who was not only, as you said, sexually abusing you, but addicted to drugs. I would imagine that it was chaos or how did you experience your home and living in it? When I was very young, some of my earliest memories, four or five years old, and I was being sexually abused at that time. There were moments of chaos in our house because of the fighting between my mother and stepfather. There was a pivotal moment when I was about five years old where my stepfather was caught in the act of abusing me by my mother, which turned into a very chaotic scene. The pivotal nature of this moment was that at some point, he returned to the home when I was still in early childhood. And I think that really shaped my sense of security and my sense of safety in my own home. Yeah, I imagine your mom not protecting you in that way had to be deeply hurtful and damaging. Absolutely. It also kind of uh, worked hand in hand with my people pleaser nature. And I was just a great student. I was always striving to please those in authority, my parents included, and um, really did not know how to stick up for myself, defend myself, because that was never taught to me. How was your mom's mental illness presenting you know, what were the symptoms that she had and that you were observing about your mother? So my mother is a brilliant woman. She, in terms of her education, she um, is was a dentist. She, in hindsight, had undiagnosed bipolar disorder, had episodes of mania, which would present in various forms, sometimes somewhat paranoid presentation. Sometimes it was excessive spending and other times it was depressive episodes. And so there were always times in our household where we were walking on eggshells because we didn't know, we as in my sister and I didn't know what version of things we were going to experience for the day. Yeah, that makes sense. So As you said, you're studious, you're academic, you're, you know, a people pleaser. As you move into, you know, what is such a, I think, vulnerable time for all of us, you're moving into your tween, early teen years. Who were you on the inside versus who you were showing up for the outside world? I was very... um... I would say, conflicted in a lot of ways. I had this kind of chaotic home scene for so many years that I had learned to compartmentalize from the studious, academic, outgoing person at school. Part of my childhood meant moving every, usually several times within a school year. So I had become very adept at adapting to new surroundings, trying to make new friends. And I presented myself in a way that I just wanted others to like me and accept me. And and so only my closest friends at certain points in my childhood knew what was going on at home and eventually helped me to tell the correct person. In junior high, when Rebecca told her friend that she was being sexually abused by her stepfather, That friend told Rebecca's mother. But as you've already heard, her mom did not take action. This same friend also told a school counselor who contacted the police. He did leave the home after this, but the police never filed charges. Rebecca says he eventually died of a stroke. And where were you moving in state or moving schools Why was all the moving happening and what did that look like? So in my early childhood, till about the age of eight, we were moving to various cities within Louisiana. 
Eventually, we moved across state lines to uh, California, where I still remain now. And when we moved here, the moving did not stop. It was sometimes a different school within the same city because we moved a couple of blocks over. Sometimes it was a whole different city and we had to kind of uproot and reestablish within the same school year. That's just so difficult for anyone, but for, I think, a girl at that age. And, you know, as you said, there's already the lack of stability and structure and safety and to add in the schools and friends and lack of consistency and connection there must have been really difficult. Yes, absolutely. It was a challenge. I think now as an adult and, you know, being a doctor now, it's actually helped me in a lot of ways to adapt to situations. But um, had I had it my way, I would preferred some stability growing up for sure. Yeah. So at the age of 14, you become pregnant. What can you tell me about that chapter in your life leading up to that? You know, where were you in your life when you had your first pregnancy? So when I was a preteen, early teen, I'd say from the age of 11 or 12, as soon as I could hang out outside of the home, I did. And I did that wherever I could. And not necessarily with the best group of people, but it were, you know, it was where I fit in. When I was 14, I um, met my daughter's father, but, you know, I became pregnant after being together with him for a few times. And it was very scary. I had never even held a baby or been around a baby. I didn't, um, while I realized the gravity of the situation, it, I don't think I fully grasped it at the time. I went through the first half of my pregnancy without telling my mom. I hid it for several months. And simultaneously during this time, my daughter's father, you know, he wouldn't speak with me the entire pregnancy virtually. So um, that was also an added layer of struggle for me. Did anyone know? I mean, I can only imagine how lonely and scared you must have felt. I There were a few people in my life that knew my closest friends knew, but really none of my teachers knew in the beginning. My, my mother didn't know. Eventually, when I was about five or six months pregnant, I you know, I told my mother that I was pregnant and moved to a different school. And what was the response or reaction when you told your mom and started telling adults? My mother, she was not angry with me. She kind of just accepted it and said, okay, this is what we'll do. And, you know, I had already been seeing a doctor on my own, but she helped me get some more medical care the other adults in my life, I felt there was a range. There were some that were supportive and, you know, really trying to root for me. But I'd say the vast majority kind of looked at me with pity in their eyes and made me feel really another added layer of shame. And I felt really marginalized in a lot of ways. It was the early 90s when the school district tucked away a pregnant 14-year-old Rebecca to a local adult school. They had a classroom for pregnant and parenting teens. You know, out of sight, out of mind. Even though the idea was to help her continue her education, it was very isolating. Her friends were in school talking about things like going to the prom and college. Meanwhile, Rebecca had no idea what was next for her. What she did know was that she needed medical care. So even though she was scared, she made an appointment with a doctor. He ended up being much older and treated her poorly. He was 
just very judgmental, very, for lack of a better word, mean. He was just very snarky in the way that he talked to me. He was very condescending, asking me why I was in this situation to begin with and did a pelvic exam, which is a very sensitive, invasive exam and did not tell me what was going to happen, what I should expect, any of those things. And I felt even more ashamed during those moments. When I had my daughter, I had turned 15. She was healthy. I was healthy. It was labor itself was relatively easy, but I was there alone. I birthed my daughter uh, by myself in the room by myself. And it was quite scary. And did her father come back into the picture? Yes, he came into the picture in the first few weeks of her life. At the time, he was an adult, and um, the authorities had caught up with him at this point. And so he was kind of feeling forced to be there. And that kind of you know, built a foundation of resentment in terms of our relationship. We did end up actually staying together and raising our daughter um, and being together for the next eight years and also had another daughter um, a few years later. And how much older was he? He was six years older than me. So what was, you know, as you said, your friends are talking about prom and going to college and you feel isolated and, you know, you're in this special program within the school. What was it like that first year of, for lack of a better word, getting your sea legs as a mother and trying to navigate and figure it all out at such a young age? So being the studious person I was when I was pregnant, I read as many parenting magazines and books I could get a hold of at the time. We didn't have internet then. And really just try to use those as my best guide. There's, as you know, (laughs) no manual that's going to tell you every single situation that's going to arise. But I did the best that I could. And I also, at the same time, when I was 15 and a half, moved out of my mother's house and moved in with her father. So I had to learn how to be a grown up at the same time. And that was definitely challenging. In a lot of ways, my my daughter and I have kind of grown up together. Yeah, that makes sense. So you move in with your boyfriend and the father of your daughter. And I know that relationship became abusive. How quickly did that happen? And what was transpiring? The abusive controlling aspect was pretty immediate. I was kind of, as you can imagine, in a very vulnerable position. So the controlling behavior and and looking back, um, you know, moving me out of my mother's home was a way to kind of isolate me from the little family that I did have. And it became a matter of telling me what I could wear, where I could go, what music to listen to, all of those things. And I became really even more isolated in the house most of the day with an infant and then a toddler. And that was the way that it started. It eventually progressed to occasional physical violence but it was uh, primarily emotional and controlling behavior that that I experienced. Yeah, it sounds like the isolation and that he made your world very small in a sense. Very small. It was basically him and I and the baby and and eventually our, our second daughter, and that was it. During this time, Rebecca did end up marrying her boyfriend, and they had their second daughter, four years after their first. Rebecca finished her high school home studies and graduated. But she did not get to walk the stage because he wouldn't allow it. After that, Rebecca went to trade school to become a medical assistant. 
She knew she wanted to do something in the medical field and thought it was a great career. She finished her education, started working, and eventually ended up getting a job with the government. But the more Rebecca interacted with people and the world around her, the more controlling and threatening he became. I felt liberated in some ways when I was at work because it was broadening my horizons and I was able to have, you know, adult conversations and friendships. But at the same time, we didn't really have cell phones at this time. So he would constantly call me at work and display threatening behavior towards me. And those who sat around me knew about the situation somewhat. Or, you know, he would be waiting for me outside work, those types of things. So it was always while I was dipping my toe in a little bit of freedom and freedom, quote unquote, going to work, (laughs) I was still really confined and and scared a lot of the times, just really scared for for my own safety. What was your fear? What did you fear around what could or would happen? My greatest fear was him taking my children. That threat was always there, both implied and just overtly said. So that was my greatest fear. My secondary fear was my physical being, you know, like I said, he was physically abusive towards me. Towards the end of our marriage, I had called the police once or twice when situations arose. But yeah, the biggest fear was breaking up and losing my my family, losing my, my children. When did you decide to leave and why? The day that I decided to leave, I had worn a pair of work pants to work and I guess they were not what he would approve of. And he called me all day at work to harass me about it. Left me, there was a voicemail option because I was working at a desk job at this time. And I decided that day that I was going to leave. When I got home, I started packing my stuff and my daughters, some items for my daughters. It turned into a violent situation. He physically tried to stop me, but I was able to escape that day. After she escaped, Rebecca, now 23, and her girls stayed temporarily on a friend's couch. Then, shortly after leaving her ex, she met someone, and they hit it off on a surface level. Rebecca ended up getting pregnant within the year that she had met him. They had a daughter, and although they married and stayed together for 10 years, she went from a bad situation to another bad situation. He definitely was not abusive, but there were lots of red flags that I chose to ignore because I didn't have a good gauge on what I needed or what I should and shouldn't tolerate. And it was kind of, I was looking for anything that was not the situation that I had with my first. And that was not a good <laughs> a ruler to, to use. He, uh, there were some infidelity issues in the beginning, the very beginning of the relationship. There were just not a lot of things that we fundamentally saw eye to eye on, which developed over time and became just not a sustainable situation. So, you know, he also, there was no cohesiveness in terms of a blended family. And that was a very big thing for me. And that never happened. I was I was trying to force it to happen and it just never did. So eventually I just had to leave that situation as well. So he had kids of his own? He had kids of his own um, and I had my two girls in our mutual. And there were times when natural sibling rivalries would come up between all three of my kids and my ex-husband would interject and play favorites and would never treat my daughters with the same love and respect as as our mutual daughters. So it was just never consistent treatment with all the kids and and all the while when my my youngest daughter was two 
I had decided to go back to school. And so having all of those things and challenges of going back to school with kids, and then on top of it, not having the peace and harmony and the kind of effort to make that happen at home just became too much. Well, yeah, that would make sense because you, I would imagine, have three daughters that you love equally and wholly, and you're watching two of them be treated in a way that isn't fair to them and is perhaps, you know, hurtful to their sense of well-being. Yes. And, you know, they were also dealing at the same time with the after effects of divorce, the after effects of witnessing their father and and my relationship. And, you know, those things were um, causing some issues, uh, even with mental health, as you can imagine. And so, you know, they at this time were in therapy and it was very contradictory because, you know, I was had them in therapy, was getting them help outside the home. But at home, there was still this situation going on. So it was kind of one was defeating the other. Yeah. Tell me about deciding to go back to school, you know, the impetus for that and when that shift in you or decision and will to do that happened. When my youngest was between the ages of one and two, I started to kind of flirt with the idea of going back to school. I had a friend of mine at the time who would take some community college classes. And she said, well, I'm going to sign up tomorrow for classes. Why don't you come with me? And I had every excuse in the world. Oh, I'm busy. I have the baby. I can't really do that. And she offered to watch my baby while, you know, while I sign up for classes. Come on, let's make this happen. So we did that. And and then I never looked back. Once I was in some classes, I just kept going. And at what point did you decide you wanted to pursue the dream and the education to become a doctor and go to medical school? When I first started classes at my local community college, I went in with the attention of just doing some basic classes to get an associate's degree. In the first semester that I was there, I took a basic biology class, which I had not had the opportunity to do in high school through homeschool. And it just reignited my passion for science. It was something that I knew that I wanted to do something with. At the same time, I met my friend there, who I'm still friends with, we're best friends, who was also there, also had three children, and was also thinking of going to medical school. And I think those things just blended all together. And that was uh, when I decided that I was going to go to medical school. And that is when 25-year-old Rebecca, mother of three, makes a big pivot and enrolls for some classes at East LA Community College. Coming up, Rebecca shares how she rebuilt her confidence and belief in herself in order to make the leap to medical school and beyond. After this short break, we'll be right back. All the Wiser is a one-for-one podcast. For every episode you hear, we donate $2,000 to our guest's favorite charity. Rebecca chose Peace Over Violence. They are a nonprofit in California providing services and support to people affected by sexual, domestic, and interpersonal violence. They also provide prevention services, including educating teens about healthy relationships. Their work even includes legal services to aid in getting victims to safety. As Rebecca said, their work is so comprehensive and they are just an all around wonderful charity. To learn more, head on over to peaceoverviolence.org. So you go to community college, take some classes that light you up. You shared that you went back and kind of remembered and reminded 
yourself how smart and capable you were, that you were, in fact, you know, intelligent and academic and all those things, but you had been, you know, in your words, dismissed as you became a teen parent. So how did you rebuild that confidence and that sense of ambition and belief in yourself? I truly think that it was not only something that I can engross myself in is the study part of it, but also there were so many great people that I was able to meet and network with through the community college. Community colleges are great for working parents, for, um, you know, people like me just trying to find their way and get the education. And so when I was surrounded by other people that were in either similar situations or their own challenging situations, and they were there doing what I was doing, I think that was a huge part of it. Once I started taking the science classes and I was doing well in them, that also fueled my fire. And and the more I did it, the more I loved it, the more people I met that were also interested in it. And my professors were great. My peer counselors were great. It was just a great support network that I know was a pivotal part of helping me um, see my potential. I, I really had lost sight of any potential, really. just I was kind of just trying to do the best that I could to make it through. But this was allowed me to dream big again. And I'm so grateful that I that I was in the right place at the right time and had those opportunities. And, you know, you are on a campus taking these classes, have this dream and plan of going further. You also are a mom of three young girls. So if you can illustrate some specific examples of what that entails to be doing both of those things at the same time, sort of coexisting in those two identities. At the time, my two older children were in school and my youngest had to go to daycare. So I really approached it as a full-time job. I would drop off my youngest at daycare and my old, older children at school go to classes when they were, you know, in school and be done by the time they came out. And so I was able to, at the end of the day, make sure that they were, you know, getting their homework done, doing my own homework. We would sit down, we would all do our homework together. I was there to cook dinner for them. Um, So we definitely made it work. And what really helped me during those time periods was to take it semester by semester and kind of build what my schedule was going to be. A big part of that also was meeting with my peer counselors at community college so that they can give me some guidance and make sure I was on track to take the classes that I needed to take. Community college, I guess, is designed to be like a two to three year experience. For me, doing what I was doing, it took me four years to get out of community college, and that was fine. I just had to do what worked for us. Where does that tenacity and drive come from? My mother has a very strong work ethic. I think that is part of where it comes from. The other part is having gone through a tough time in my childhood, in my teen years as a teen parent, having been through an abusive relationship, I felt like I could do anything that I put my mind to. I felt that those challenges really showed me how strong I was. And I really think that helped fuel me to do things that I needed to do in order to reach my goals. And then, you know, it's not always like that. You surround yourself with people that are supportive, like my friends and my sister's always been a big support. And so during times of doubt, that's where that is very helpful. Yeah, you're really able to see all of these things that were really difficult, whether it was the appointment with the doctor or the moving schools or 
the years of surviving abuse and using them to either guide you in the other direction for the doctor you want to be or remind you of your ability to persevere. And I don't know that everyone looks back on things and sees them within that light. Yeah, I think um, I've always been a very optimistic person. And I think it was a trait that I developed because it was a self-survival type of technique that I developed because in the really dark moments, there had to be something better. There had to be something to look forward to. And I'm still a very optimistic person, sometimes to a fault, but it really has served me well in my life. And I think it'll continue to serve me well. So Rebecca finished her four years at City College and applied to transfer to a four-year university to get her bachelor's degree. She got accepted to UCLA, one of the most prestigious universities in the country. She was ecstatic, yet those were also some very challenging years. The competition between students was fierce. Meanwhile, she's still trying to be there for her kids, going to every dance class and band performance, while trying to have dinner on the table every single night. That was always a priority for me. So that was all very challenging. Around this time, my sister relocated to the area and she was able to provide a a lot of support in that way. She was able to, you know, give my kids rides when I wasn't able to. She helped them with homework when I wasn't there. So I, I did have that extra family support when I needed it. And that was just invaluable. I, I don't think, you know, I, it would have been very hard to do this without her. Um, and around the same time, um, so towards the end of my two-year stint to finish my bachelor's degree, I started to apply to various medical schools. One of the things that happen when you apply to medical school is that you have to apply very broadly because there are thousands of applicants at every medical school and it's very competitive. So that was an adventure. And also I was preparing myself and my family for the possibility that we might have to relocate for this. And with my own background of having to go to school, to school, to school, I was trying to avoid that at all costs. And I was very fortunate to um, uh, land a spot at my dream medical school, which was UCLA Medical School. So I didn't have to go very far (laughs) to go to medical school. And when you're getting your bachelor's, like the people in your classes, who are they and what are they doing? They are all college kids. I don't remember meeting any parents when I was still working on my bachelor's degree when I was at UCLA. So I was competing with brilliant students that really didn't have a whole lot of home obligations outside of just studying for school. And there were times of doubt for sure that maybe this was a crazy dream. Maybe I was mistaken. Maybe this wasn't what my path was supposed to be. But, you know, I stayed the course I studied for the MCAT, which is an entrance test for medical school. I did what I could do, and and I went into it with the mindset that I'm going to do my best to try to do this, and if I fall short, then I will think of a plan B and try again. (laughs) And what was the status at this time of your marriage? Around this time, it was becoming more and more challenging. My kids were getting older and I could see the effects of the marriage on them. And it was also affecting me and my ability to study at times. You know, it was becoming to the point where I couldn't, I needed to find a a way to fix this situation. What were the effects you were seeing on, on your kids? My oldest daughter both actually both of my oldest older daughters were um, experiencing depression, some anxiety. They were still seeing therapists. My oldest daughter, her anxiety manifested in some physical symptoms like vomiting. And so those were things that just were not okay. 
So you're starting to see the impact of the home environment really show up in the girls. Yes. At the time, having them in therapy also um, and having conversations with their therapist as, you know, as a family and by family, I mean myself and my kids, it just became, you know, it was very apparent and they were, they were very vocal and very, um, and I appreciate them being able to voice what they were feeling and, and how they were feeling during this time. And so I formulated a plan to remedy that by divorcing him. Rebecca was now in her first three months of her first year of medical school. It's a hard and scary time in any med student's life, but the thought of staying in a marriage that was affecting her children so negatively was even scarier. Luckily, her sister was still living nearby and offered to take them in for a while. So medical school, you're starting at 33, which I guess isn't all that young for medical school. Yes. The typical age is like 24 to 28-ish. And I was the second oldest medical student in my class. Um, And probably the only student with a 17-year-old child. (laughs) Definitely. She graduated uh, high school during my first year of medical school. (laughs) It's one thing to be in community college. It's a whole nother thing to be at UCLA applying for medical school. And then just the intensity and amount of work and time that goes into it. How many years and how, what did you lean in into and tap into to get through that? The program that I actually got into is Charles Drew University slash UCLA. So it's a combo program. And Charles Drew University was so instrumental in terms of supporting me in ways that when I needed added support, they were there and helped me get through my journey. There was a time during my second year of medical school where where I was struggling to pass a couple of my classes and they were there to give me added support by way of tutoring, by way of extra books and supplies and those things that really helped me to survive the the rigor of medical school. And so, you know, I had a, a community of the educators that were helping me. I had a community, you know, with my sister being there to help me. And um, at this time, my friends were really rooting for me. My friend that I mentioned earlier that I met at community college was also in in medical school, a a different medical school. And we really leaned on each other to to help support us through through the challenges of medical school. But it it was tough. You know, there, there were some parents that were in medical school, but there were no single parents that I was aware of in my class. So sometimes it felt a little bit like I was on on an island. (laughs) And did your exes remain in the lives of your children or in your life? When I first separated from my first husband, he was very much involved in trying to do what he said and take my children away. And so it, it you know, by calling CPS and making reports on me that were false and fighting me in court for many years. Once that was over and my kids were teenagers, he wasn't around so much. When I divorced my second husband, he did remain in the life of my youngest and still has a relationship with my youngest. So how long does medical school take? And when do you decide what you know, specific path within medicine you're going to pursue? Most people decide what path they're going to pursue in the third year of medical school, sometimes the fourth, but mostly the third. I really loved my surgical rotation and had decided I was going to be a surgeon. I later chose family medicine for multiple reasons, but a big part of it was that the residency was shorter and I could be available for my children more. There was a time in medical school during my third year where my my youngest was struggling. My youngest was diagnosed with bipolar disorder also, 
she just needed me. She needed more of my attention during that time frame. So I took the time off and, um, and it was the absolute right decision to do at the time. During that time, um, I needed to make some money. So I, I was doing some jobs. I, I worked as a bartender during that time I had off so that I could be there for my daughter. So what year was that, you said? It was year three of medical school. So you go back to medical school. Tell me about getting to the finish line and what that felt like, too, to, you know, having graduated high school, homeschooling and not walking across the graduation stage to now be graduating from medical school. It was surreal in so many ways. It was the culmination of so many years, so many challenges, both personal and, you know, academically. And to be on a stage to receive my medical school diploma, having been dismissed by so many, having been told, why don't you do this or that and in kind of trying to direct my future, um, you know, having followed my dream and succeeded and did what I knew in my heart was right was just a surreal moment. And one of the proudest moments of my life, I had my, my kids were there when, when we, when I graduated and it was just one of the, the most memorable moments of my life. And what were the things that, you know, when you say people said do this or do that and sort of, it sounds like minimizing your potential or putting you in some sort of a box, what were people's advice and limitations around you and your potential? When I was in high school going through home studies, there was never any talk about going to college. There was never any talk about pursuing a higher degree even beyond college. It was just get through high school. When I had gone through my community college, um, there was a time when I did a summer program that was designed for pre-medical and pre-dental students. And there was a counselor there that even after all of the achievements that I had reached up into that point to be there, had said, why don't we come up with the plan B? Because I just needed some reassurance in the moment. And I asked this counselor, I said, am I crazy for wanting to do this? Can I do this? Can I go to medical school? And I felt so defeated after talking to her because she was implying that I really couldn't do this. And so when I was walking across the stage to get my medical diploma, it was remembering those types of moments when I had the self-doubt, I had the doubts of others, and those were just dissipating. All this while you are the mother of three daughters who, you know, are now grown and out of the house. And I kept thinking about them watching you and what that must have evoked in them and what I'm sure they will pass down to their kids if they decide to have children. But what do you think, how... Now, looking back, do you experience that, you setting this example for the girls? I tell you, it's one of the greatest things to hear when my kids tell others that they're proud of me and they tell me that they're proud of me. It's an indescribable feeling. So they have told me that they're inspired to pursue their education. And and my two older daughters are are in um, college right now. My youngest is not far out from high school. One of them just graduated with her master's degree. The other one's working on her bachelor's. So, you know, they have seen by example that this is a priority for them and have learned so many ways. Um, they've also learned from, from witnessing the challenges that we've gone through as a family unit, um, how to care for themselves and, you know, get therapy and those types of things. And so, you know, I'm I'm really proud of, of what my kids have achieved.
So tell me about, you know, you're a practicing doctor today. So tell me about the work you're doing and how you believe your past being a teen parent and the adversity, you know, before and after that has shaped the way you treat your patients and how you move through the world and operate in your profession. I 1000% believe that all of my experiences to this point have shaped my ability to connect with my patients. I always go into a patient encounter with an open mind and open heart and never judgmental. You just never know what people are going through internally until you approach it in an open way and in a way that allows people to express what they're feeling. With the negative experience I had with the doctor when I was pregnant also really helped me to come into this profession with an open mind and an open heart for my patients and with compassion and empathy. What do you think some of the misconceptions, you know, societal misconceptions or beliefs are around teen parents? One of the things that I experienced firsthand was that there was this automatic assumption that I was not intelligent because I had a baby at an early age. Another one is that I just didn't care about myself or my body. And that's why I ended up in the situation that I was in. And all of these things are just not true. I think that there's always been this societal misconception that every teen parent is living on welfare and there is nothing wrong with getting financial assistance when you need it, but that this is what their whole purpose is. And, you know, they don't really have any potential, you know, left in them. And, and I'm here to dispel those myths and those misconceptions because those are just not true. Have you, and do you interact with girls and, you know, they're really, I guess, emerging young women who are pregnant or are parenting? I have a few times in my career as a doctor, but I have more so when I've sought out opportunities to work with this population because it's something that I've always wanted to do. When I was in medical school, I did a year-long project with a colleague of mine in which we built workshops for teen parents in the East LA area. And now as a practicing physician, I've just started working with the San Diego School District Teen Parent Program to help mentor some teen parents. So my next set of goals is to really dig deep and get more involved in that way. I also want to write a book and also share a collection of success stories of teen parents. I think it's super important to share these stories of inspiration and and to inspire teen parents. Yeah, there's this idea that I've heard recently, which makes a lot of sense to me that so often as adults, we are drawn to the work that we needed as a child. You know, probably why I'm telling stories about mental health that are comforting is because I really needed that when I was diagnosed and didn't see any girls or women out there talking. And it's clear that full circle has come for you too, and that you're now going back to the very place you were in your life when you were scared and alone. So I think that's really beautiful. Thank you. What do you hope people take away from your story? One major um, message that I hope people take away is really to never let others define what your potential is. If I had done that, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so I just want people to define what their own potential is and what whatever that might look like for them. You know, the, I want them to be able to 
see it and look for the steps to get there. And also the other takeaway is to ask for help. You know, I used my resources when I was in college, community college and beyond because those resources are there. People want to help. And so see your potential and look for those helpers along the way. Well, I love your story and you sharing it with our audience and the example you have set for your three daughters and I imagine so many, you know, young girls and women you've encountered. So thank you for being on the show and making that available to all who listen. Thank you so much, Kimmy. I really appreciate it. Rebecca is now happily married to a patient and loving man. Her daughters are well-adjusted and excelling in school. Her youngest, who uses they-them pronouns, is doing well and found the right medication to treat their bipolar disorder. Rebecca's oldest gave birth to a healthy baby boy, and Rebecca became a grandma at the ripe old age of 39. By the way, are we friends on social media? Come and find us on Instagram at All The Wiser Podcast. You'll be able to see pictures of our guests, hear the latest updates from the show, and so much more. All The Wiser is produced by me, Erica Gerard, from Podkid Productions. I'm John LaSala, the editor and composer and sound designer. This is associate producer, Tara Daigle. And I'm Kimmy Colt. Until next time, take care of yourself and one another. Hello, wise ones. We have officially launched All the Wiser Membership. If you love this show and the stories and wisdom we share, this is for you. We have everything from early release, live Zooms with me and the All The Wiser team, and you can even drop in and watch a recording. You can also get voice memos directly from me and receive producer credit with your name added to our website wall. You can learn more about the membership, including a short video for me, and sign up for the membership using the Patreon link below in our show notes. You can also go to allthewiserpodcast.com or Instagram at allthewiserpodcast to learn more.